Friends, I invite you once again to join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and that your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you are saying to us today. Amen. As Janine shared with our younger church, we will be starting out this morning with a passage from the Gospel of Matthew, starting at the end of chapter 16 with verse 24. Let us hear these words from the early church. Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became a dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from that cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus himself alone. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Ebenezer Bryce was a famous cattleman. He ran his cattle herds on the land that we now call Bryce Canyon National Park. Now, very, very few people can stand on that canyon's rim, look down at the scene below, and fail to sense awe and inspiration. But Ebenezer Bryce was asked what it was like to have spent his life working in such a setting of overwhelming natural beauty. The cattleman took a deep breath and replied, it's one heck of a place to lose a cow. That's a strange reply to such beauty. But Ebenezer Bryce was concerned with what he was doing rather than with the grandeur, his focus His lens were his cattle. Too often, I think our lenses help blind us to the beauty and the wonder of life. Like Ebenezer Bryce, we let our concerns, our fears, even our passions be the lens through which we see the world, and that can limit us. But our text from Matthew this week represents a chance for us to take a step back and perhaps to begin to look with clarity around us. Transfiguration Sunday marks a halfway point on our journey from Christmas to Holy Week. Now, immediately preceding this passage throughout the 16th chapter, Jesus continues to foretell his own death and resurrection. And as our text begins six days later, a week almost, plenty of time for all of that teaching to sink in, Jesus takes Peter and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, away with him. Ostensibly, we think to pray. 
And there Jesus is transformed. He is transfigured. His face shines like the sun, his clothes a dazzling white. And two of the founding fathers of Judaism appear with him on this mountain. It is dramatic, it is wild, and I can promise you that neither Peter, James, nor John suspected that this is what was going to happen when they went up the mountain. It is a quintessential mountaintop experience. Now, we as religious people, we kind of toss that phrase around without really thinking about it. Throughout our scriptures, both Hebrew and New Testament, People retreat to the mountains in an effort to encounter God. Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Jesus. Mountains, especially mountain tops, are understood by our scriptures as thin places, places where the boundary between heaven and earth seems a bit more porous. Now, like any of us who has had a mountaintop experience, Peter wants his to last. Hence, he offers to build permanent places. You can almost hear him offer to set a retreat center here. But God has vastly different plans. God's message should ring in our ears as familiar from what rang from heaven during the baptism. But the biggest difference is that God is speaking today directly to the disciples. This event is for their benefit. And God asks them to listen. Something that we know the disciples are not very good at doing. Peter, in particular, and the disciples as a whole, often act as a stand-in for us, the audience. They can point out our inability or unwillingness to just exist in the moment. Peter rushes things. Peter misunderstands. He speaks when he should be silent. And it's almost as if Peter's faux pas is what prompts God to finally just scream out, listen, for Pete's sake, take a moment and slow down. You're not going to get it until you're quiet. Why do you think we brought you up here onto this mountain? And quite understandably, the disciples literally fall on their faces in fear and trembling because they have gotten a rather harsh reminder of exactly who and what they are dealing with. Frankly, friends, sometimes we need that reminder too. When we're honest with ourselves, when we stop and consider all the ways that we attempt to domesticate God. We have our image, frankly, our idol, a God that we're familiar and comfortable with and placated by. We are vastly more comfortable with the Jesus that is meek and mild, that shepherd standing tall with a single lamb over his shoulders, the Jesus who comforts us but doesn't expect too much of us. We don't often spend our time contemplating the Jesus that overturns tables and brandishes a whip, the Jesus that literally compares the Syrophoenician woman to a dog, the Jesus who looks a grieving disciple in the face and says, let the dead bury the dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. But our scriptures tell us That is Jesus as well. And we cannot let the veil of our own comfort and our own complacency take precedence and blind us from that vision of God. We often forget, I often forget, but we don't come into this building, this beautiful building, gather in this place with these wonderful people only to be made comfortable with how we are and how the world is. God is constantly pushing our boundaries. If we are not disturbed by the words of the gospel, we are not listening well enough. 
We can really see this in the selection that the narrative lectionary uses for transfiguration today. We don't start at the beginning of verse of chapter 17. The narrative lectionary starts at the very end of chapter 16, and it forces us to look at Jesus' transfiguration through the lens of the cross and self-denial. Jesus literally says, what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their lives? That flies in the face of how our world understands power and might. The same God that is bathed in awe and majesty, whose all-encompassing power and beauty blinds the disciples, engages the world not through power and might, but through self-denial. So when we think about the transfiguration, about that moment where the disciples saw a glimpse behind the veil, when we think about seeing the way that God sees through all the things that we let blind us, we are forced to wrestle with ourselves and with our world. Seeing God in the world means to truly see injustice and inequality and not be numbed to it. It means really being present with the people on the margins whom we've trained our eyes to kind of pass over or even look directly through. Seeing with God's eyes is to know in the depth of our very being that we must be as concerned with the least of these as we are with ourselves. We can't leave transfiguration to the mountaintops, friends. We can't leave seeing behind our veils to special places and special times and special retreat centers. Our calling from God is to see the world differently, to see clearly, if I may, with all of our lenses and all of our blinders removed, even when we come down from those mountaintop heights. God is challenging us to be different, to choose different than the world. The transfiguration story, with all of its power and all of its beauty and mystery, help keep us from making Jesus and the message of the gospel too small. We should be falling on our faces in fear and trembling before the might of our Lord, the awesome power and the might of the God we worship, the God that calls us to do difficult and dangerous things. The writer Annie Dillard puts a very, very fine point on it when she says this, does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we blithely invoke when we call upon God? Or, as I suspect, do we not believe a word of it? It is truly madness for us to come to church in our straw hats. We should be wearing crash helmets. For the sleeping God may awake one day and take offense, or the waking God may draw us into places from which we can never return. Friends, her words carry power as we look at this transfiguration story when we are reminded that God calls us to be and live and see differently. Like the disciples, whenever we encounter God, those experiences change us. And they call us to encounter the world differently. As we begin our Lenten journey this week, we will be exploring more in depth what Jesus means when he says that to be followers of God, we must take up our cross and follow. But as we stand on this precipice today, we know 
God is asking us to slow down and to listen. God is transfiguring us and through us, the world. There is a very powerful image in the very last Harry Potter book that helps. And I promise I was going to say this before Poppy even brought it up. (laughs) Toward the beginning of the Deathly Hallows, Harry is attending the wedding of Bill Weasley and Fleur Delacour. And throughout these books, Fleur Delacour is described as a girl that is so beautiful. Stereotypically, all the men can't speak in front of her and all the women despise her. Her beauty is described as eclipsing everything around her. Harry's best friend, Ron, literally can't form words to the woman who will soon be his sister-in-law. But on her wedding day, Flora wears a tiara, one that transfigures all of those around her. She's no longer the center of attention. Instead, everyone around her glows. While her radiance usually dimmed everyone by comparison, today it beautified everybody it fell upon. Her presence rendered others beautiful, and guests couldn't understand how they had never noticed that those around them shone. When we gather in the presence of God, friends, we shine light from within light that comes from our creator. It's not a light that we can keep to ourselves, but rather one that is called to help the faces of those around us shine, to make the world shine with God's light. May that be so, that we take that light to all when we leave from this place today. Amen.